Endocrinological disorders constitute a very important part in pediatric practice. That's why our next session is about some endocrinological problems facing every pediatrician. I have the honor to call the chairpersons of our next session, Dr. Hanan Qattan and Dr. Ala Al Qattan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, good evening. We would like uh, to have now our next session, which will be endocrinology. Uh, we will talk about two important topics, uh, thyroid and uh, uh, vitamin D. We'll start to, to welcome our first, first speaker, Dr. Dalia Abdrazag. Dr. Dalia is an assistant professor, Department of Pediatrics, Faculty of Medicine, Kuwait University. She is a pediatric endocrinologist in Mubarak Hospital and in Desman Diabetic Institute. Welcome, Dr. and you can start. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me to participate in this com impressive conference. So I've been given the task to talk about thyroid disease, what is important to, you, to general pediatricians, and I've been given quite a, t a challenging task to talk about this in 20 minutes. So I'll talk about some of the thyroid issues that are uh, important for general pediatricians. And the way I decided to do this is I'll take three short cases that are relevant um, uh, for general pediatricians from the endocrinology point of view. Uh, I'll ask a question after each case for the audience and take what you think about them. And then we'll discuss the science and evidence from the literature rela uh, related to each case. And then I'll end up with some conclusions and recommendations from endocrinology to you regarding each case. So without further ado, let's start. So this is the first case that I'll share with you. This is a four-month-old, previously healthy boy who was seen for episodes of jitterness in the emergency department at um, uh, a, general, uh, a general hospital. He was born in Kuwait Maternity Hospital on July 2015 to a 30-year-old healthy mother. Now, this is his birth weight, 4,800 grams, which placed him at positive 2.63 standard deviation uh, as per the WHO growth standards that we started using in Kuwait quite a few years ago. Now, on exam, now these pictures, this is not the real patient. This is pictures are taken from the internet. Uh, and as you see, on examination, the patient had, oops, I'm not sure if you can see this. So as you see here, his tongue was quite enlarged and he has an umbilical hernia on examination. Now I'd like to ask you, you are the, uh, in the emergency department, and what test would you order as a priority for diagnostic workup? So with show of hands, who would choose to do a liver function test? Okay. Who would choose to do a blood glucose? Okay, and who would choose to do a thyroid function test? <laughs> okay, and who would do an ECG? All right. So for this child, a blood glucose was a priority. Now, I know you thought, because I'm an endocrinologist, I'll be presenting a thyroid-related case. But uh, for this case, we see that the thyroid gets blamed for a lot of emergency uh, presentations in pediatrics. Now you see, this child had peak with Wiedemann syndrome, and he presented with hypoglycemia to the emergency department, and that's why he was jittery. He, and these kids, they have macroglossia and umbilical hernia as well. Now the classical teaching we had in medical school that also kids with congenital hypothyroidism, they present with uh, large tongues and umbilical hernias. However, this child was born in Kuwait in the maternity hospital in 2015, where we do screening for our thyroid, uh, we do newborn screening for thyroid uh, disorders. And a child at four months presenting with congenital hypothyroidism, quite averted as this, is unheard of in Kuwait nowadays. These kids do not get presented to us with abnormal signs and symptoms. So let me talk about uh, some science behind congenital hypothyroidism. Now, congenital hypothyroidism is an important disease because it's the most common preventable cause of endocrinological cause of um, most common preventable cause of mental retardation. Now, depend from country to country, the cause of congenital hypothyroidism differs, but the most common cause is developmental abnormalities within the thyroid gland where it doesn't develop very well, such as ectopic thyroid, thyroid agenesis, or dyshormonogenesis, and 
for a lesser extent, abnormality secondary or tertiary hypothyroidism secondary to abnormalities in the hypothalamus or the pituitary. Now, the classical signs and symptoms, what we got taught in, the me in medical schools for children presenting with congenital hypothyroidism are listed here, and as you see, they present with decreased activity, large anterior fontanelle, poor feeding, not growing well, uh, constipation, hypothyroid, um, uh, hypotonia, sorry, hoarse cry, coarse features, some, uh, similar to our patient, microglossia, umbilical hernia, developmental delay later on, pallor, mexedema, and goiter. Such as, this, uh, such as this patient. This patient has congenital hypothyroidism. You see that he's hypotonic, he has large tongue and umbilical hernia. However, nowadays, it's unlikely to see a patient presenting as an infant with such picture because of, the new, of our newborn screening program. Okay, so think less of it. Don't blame the thyroid and look for other cases. We never see infants presenting this way nowadays. The most common presentation in Kuwait of congenital hypothyroidism is an abnormal newborn screening. Now, some evidence behind congenital hypothyroidism. Now, it's important to diagnose congenital hypothyroidism in kids, and that's why newborn screening has been introduced in the first place, because timing of the normalization of the thyroid function test influences your outcome. Now, normal development can be achieved in most of these kids uh, if you start the treatment earlier. And in the literature, within the two, first two weeks, if we start treatment, we can get a normal, um, um, normal development. However, some might have subtle neurocognitive deficits, depending on the degree, the timing of presentation, and also the compliance to treatment. Newborn screening has been shown uh, to be the most effective way of preventing mental retardation and ensuring normal IQ in this patient population. Now, it's the conclusion from uh, my first case then, that screening programs have led to a successful early detection and treatment of infants with congenital hypothyroidism, and we have this in Kuwait. Early detection and treatment of congenital hypothyroidism through newborn screening prevents neurodevelopmental disability and optimizes developmental outcomes for these kids. So this is what I recommend from case one for all our colleagues in general pediatrics. If you suspect an infant with congenital hypothyroidism, please ask about the newborn screening result and if it's, if it's done. And try to review our local uh, newborn screening protocol that got introduced in Kuwait. And in case of an abnormal thyroid newborn screening, please, please consult an endocrinologist as timing of initiation of therapy is crucial for these kids. And these are some uh, resources, usable resources, about congenital hypothyroidism introduced by the European Society and the American Society of, Pedi uh, of Pediatric Endocrinology that I find quite helpful for us endocrinologists, but also for general pediatrics as well. So this is the, fir the first case, and I'll be happy to take questions about each case after I'm done with the uh, presentation. Now, this is the second case. So most of you, this, this is the same kid, so most of you asked for a thyroid function test to be done on this child at the emergency department. So this is the same child presenting. Now, you're seeing this, in, uh, this patient in Mubarak al-Kabir Hospital. You asked for the thyroid function test, as most of you asked for. And this is the results that you get. Okay, so the TSH was 7.1. The reference value that you get in Mubarak Hospital released from you from the, from the lab is 0 0.27 to 0 0.24.2. To this is the normal TSH as per the lab at our, um, our institution. And free thyroid, uh, free T4 was 16.3. Uh, and the reference value is shown as per Mubarak Kabir Hospital lab. Now, I'll take your response here as well. I need your help. What would be your next step? You will repeat thyroid function now immediately to confirm congenital hypothyroidism. By show of hands, no. All right, you follow up the thyroid function test in four to eight weeks. Okay, you start levothyroxine immediately because as we decreased earlier that this child uh, have uh, to decrease the chance of future developmental delay. Okay, um, you suspect a thyroid abnormality because of this thyroid function test and you order a thyroid scan. Okay. Now, for those who said that we follow the thyroid function test in four to eight weeks, you are absolutely correct. Now, this is still bikuth biedermann syndrome, okay? Now, you asked for the thyroid function test, and 
Thyroid function tests are quite interesting in the first year of life and even more interesting in the first month of life as, the, as TSH level changes in the first year of life depending on the age. And the reference value that we get in most of our general hospitals reflect adult reference values. They're not adjusted for age, unfortunately, as they get released to you. So keep that in mind. TSS surges within the first 15 to 60 minutes of life, reaching a peak between 25 and 160 uh, at about 30 minutes. And then it declines rapidly within the first week of life. And that's why we do the newborn screening after the TSH surge, which is usually at day three to five uh, of life. Now, reference values are different according to age and according to lab. And uh, for example, you see here that in the first year of life, we accept up to 7.7 .7 level of TSH. We don't take it as abnormal, even though that it's released from your lab as abnormal. In prepubertal kids, we accept up to 5.5. And in pubertal kids and adults, we accept up to 4.8. Uh, so, and as you see, this is some evidence in the literature they found, as you see, as labeled here on, um, inside the red bubble, that a TSH of less than 10 in an infant, we usually follow these kids and we don't start treatment as it's not linked to any abnormalities later on in life. And they found that a TSH of 10 or more, this is the level that you have to worry about and refer for possible therapy as it's linked with abnormal neurodevelopmental, uh, neurodevelopmental delays later on. So in conclusion from this case, that thyroid function test reference values are different according to age. And I urge you to contact your local lab for references of thyroid function tests according to age. But if the TSH levels in an infant, a neonate or an infant, are persistently above 10, please consider referring for replacement therapy. Okay. All right. So the first two cases was mostly about neonates with abnormal thyroid function test. So I, cho I, cho uh, I chose the third case to be an older child with an abnormal thyroid function test. Now this is a 12 year old girl that we get, re similar cases get referred to us constantly in the endocrine department at Mubarak Al Kabir Hospital. So she is a 12 year old girl who was referred to the pediatric, uh, pediatrics outpatient clinic with concerns about increased weight. She has been gaining weight gradually in the past three years. On review of her food intake, her food intake seemed to be increasing with multiple snacking, but however, the mother noticed that she has no will to do any physical activities. She always uh, stays uh, playing with her video games. She has been not sleeping well and feels tired during the day. Her maternal aunt and grandmother are suffering from a hypothyroid condition from which they're taking pills. However, it was not specified what condition this was. Now, her growth parameters are as follows. Her weight was 62.5 kilograms, and her height was 146.7 centimeters, giving her a BMI of 29 kilograms per meter square, and that's equivalent to positive 2.2, a 2.66 standard deviations uh, score for obesity, um, that's obesity for her age and gender as per the WHO growth chart. So this child is obese. Now, as part of the workup that was done at the polyclinic, they did a thyroid function test. Uh, as family, uh, the mother and grandmother has having hypothyroid disease and also she's obese. So the thyroid again gets, um, we think about the thyroid gland in this context as well. So the thyroid function test, as you see from here, you have a TSH of 9.2 and a free thyroid, uh, free T4 level of 7.9, okay? Now, the TSH for her age, uh, as we discussed earlier, is high, so 9.2. It is high even for her age. Now, because of this, uh, the thyroid, um, uh, the family got worried, and they were seen at the private hospital, and they did a thyroid ultrasound, and uh, the thyroid ultrasound showed increased thyroid volume and vascularity. So that's why she got referred to me in the outpatient clinic. Now, I need your help with this. After looking at the ab abnormal thyroid function test, which was abnormal, and the thyroid ultrasound, what would, you, uh, what would be your next, the next step? You label her as hypothyroidism and start levothyroxine, which is thyroid, re uh, thyroid hormone replacement. Okay. 
Re um, you worried about the thyroid ultrasound, and you refer for a fine needle aspiration. All right. Um, you want to confirm this, and you repeat your thyroid function test on ultrasound. And we refer the child for dietitian and lifestyle counseling. Okay, so this is what I did. I referred her for a dietitian and live, uh, lifestyle counseling, basically, because obesity has been linked with abnormal thyroid function tests, not necessarily as a cause, but a consequence, and I'll explain that. Now, some science behind thyroid, behind thyroid disease thyroid function test, and obesity. Now, the body composition and thyroid hormones are closely related, and that's why we think about thyroid function when we're seeing a child who is obese, and we try to blame the obesity on, uh -huh. uh, on hypothyroidism. The thyroid regulates body composition through regulation of basal metabolic rate, thermogenesis, lipid and glucose metabolism, food intake, and fat oxidation. So, it's um, it will be okay to say that hypothyroidism can cause weight increase together with it because of decreased metabolic rate and thermogenesis. However, this is exaggerated. We see that in, uh, nowadays the epidemic in obesity is less likely related to thyroid illnesses and the abnormalities of thyroid function tests are a consequence <coughs> of obesity, not a cause. And I'll explain that. Now, a lot of theories have been suggested uh, behind why obese kids and adults have abnormal thyroid fun function tests as a consequence. Now, the body tries to compensate for the obesity by increasing uh, total uh, T3 and free T3 as a defense mechanism, okay, to counteract the accumulation of fat by increasing thyroid hormone that will lead to increased energy expenditure, increased basal metabolic rate, and at the end, increased total energy expenditure in order to counteract the increase in weight. Also, it has been suggested that expression of TSH and thyroid hormone receptors are reduced in edible cells of the obese subjects, and that's why the signaling pathway gets abnormal, and you get abnormal thyroid function tests in kids who are obese as a consequence of obesity, not vice versa. Also, obesity, as we all know, is an inflammatory state. And the access, the thyroid access, is quite sensitive to inflammatory states in the body and respond accordingly. So this is some evidence behind these theories. Now, this is a study done in the West. And as you see here, I can't. OK, so as you see on your uh, Victor, uh, three minutes. Yes, thank you very much. So on the left side, you see that Obese kids have been studied and compared to kids uh, who have a normal uh, body mass index, i.e. controls, and they studied their thyroid function tests. And on the left side, the figure on the left side, you see that kids who have obesity, normal kids with just obesity, they have elevated TSH at baseline compared to their counterparts who are not obese. What they did in the study as well, to link it to obesity, they took these obese kids and they entered it in the program in order to lose weight. And that's their phase two studies. And they looked after they lost the weight or as they are losing weight, what happened to the thyroid function test. And as you see on the right hand side, the figure that you see some of the kids, um, phase two is obese kids before intervention. And phase two is after intervention, a lot of the kids, except for two or three people, uh, kids that TSH had normalized after losing the weight. Okay. And also, you see, in our case, the, our child had also abnormal um, thyroid on the, on the thyroid ultrasound and has been shown uh, in the literature that obesity is increased. Obesity is increased with, uh, is associated with increased thyroid volume. And as you see here, this is a thyroid ultrasound of three different patients. A, on your left-hand side, is a patient with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and this is how uh, a thyroid inflammation appears with increased ecogenicity as shown by the arrows. Now, B, on the right, the right upper side, is a thyroid ultrasound of a patient with obesity, and as you see, they have increased ecogenicity similar to patients with thyroiditis, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That's not shown in a thyroid gland of a normal patient um, at row right lower. So you see we don't have increased ecogenicity. So kids with simple obesity, they have abnormal thyroid function tests 
and also evidence of uh, thyroid increased epidemiogenicity on ultrasound that can be mistaken for a thyroiditis, but it's actually secondary to obesity and the inflammatory state rather than something abnormal or an inflammation of the thyroid gland. So, as a conclusion for this case, I hope you take from this that obese children may show different degrees of alteration pertaining to thyroid function as a consequence of obesity but not as a cause of obesity. Caution is recommended with diagnosing these kids with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You have to confirm the diagnosis of thyroiditis and it's similar because you have evidence in ultrasound of abnormal thyroid function tests. So it's similar to thyroid, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So please, the diagnosis should be based upon uh, establishing the presence of antithyroid antibodies which are usually positive in Hashimoto's thyroiditis but negative in those patients with obesity. And regarding treatment, obese kids with abnormal thyroid function tests require no therapy for their thyroid abnormality, but of course they need dietitian and lifestyle counseling. So my recommendation at the end is don't blame the thyroid for uh, obesity. All right, and this is a quite a useful resource about thyroid function and obesity, and I think it would be really helpful for you to read this, and it helped me. And I ended up with the three cases and some recommendations and uh, conclusions that I hope are helpful for you, and thank you very much. And this is my email. Thank you for your this uh, 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 so you talked about the newborn screening test. You know the newborn screening test sometimes always is made by tandem spectrum. Uh, the level sometimes it's higher, much higher than 90, from the 27 to 4. Uh, sometimes it reach 20. What do you think about this? If you can give us a brief. So up to 10. You start treatment. These are levels that you do the regular thyroid function test. Now, the levels that you get a newborn screening, which is a heel prick test, okay, the reference values are completely different because the method is completely different. So the cutoff point is not 10 or 9, which is different. The, the cutoff points in newborn screening are quite different, and we have a protocol for this. Like above 40 is something like, like uh, abnormality. You have to start treatment right away. Uh, between 20 and 40 you consider but you have to repeat less than 20 is normal so levels what I showed again are levels th normal th TSH levels done for the thyroid function test and not for the newborn screening results that you get in um, uh, for neonates thank you very much for the question thank you The, if I'm understanding correctly, so do I advise using, using thyroid drops for treatment of thyroid? For promoting, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Weight reduction. Yes. Yes, promoting weight reduction. Now, there is a lot of people that think that giving thy, uh, thyroid replacement um, to a child who has just normal obesity will uh, eventually increase your basic metabolic rate and so on and help with weight reduction. Now, levothyroxine or thyroid replacement is not approved as a drug for weight reduction. As an endocrinologist, a pediatric endocrinologist, I advise against using this drug for weight reduction as the thyroid function tests in these obese kids as ab are abnormal. However, if you replace them with extra thyroid um, uh, extra um, uh, thyroid hormone replacement, you may get into the risk of hyperthyroidism, which has also negative consequences. So I advise against it, and it's not used, uh, it's not approved, and it's not used for weight reduction. Thank you for the question.